Enjoy all your favorite sports like never before at BetMGM. Sign up using code Hawkeye and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if you don't win your first bet. When you register with BetMGM, you'll get instant access to a variety of parlay selection features, live betting options, and the best daily promotions in the business. And with BetMGM at your fingertips, every play and every game matters more than ever. Remember to use code Hawkeye and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if you don't win your first bet. Place your money line, prop, or parlay bets with the king of sportsbooks today. Bet MGM and GameSense remind you to play responsibly. Bet MGM.com for terms. 21 plus only. Iowa only. New customer offer. Subject to eligibility requirements. Rewards are non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-BETS-OFF. T-Biz Podcast delivers T-News that you need to know. A recap of the week's major headlines with commentary and cultural trends hosted by Dan Bolton. It is the voice of origin for tea professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. Tea is a fascinating and intricate topic, far more complex than anyone can master. Our expertise resides in storytelling by professionals who know the tea lands from birth and speak the native tongue. We believe that transparency is grounded at origin, which is why the T-Biz portal enlists 40 voices skilled in 12 languages to tell the story of tea. Hello, everyone. Here are this week's headlines. There's not much to celebrate on Earth Day this year. A weak IPO signals bubble tea trouble. And tea and tea-based beverage market projections show strong growth. Plus, a tea value chain upgrade. The London Tea Auction in 1679 was a version 1.0 marvel at connecting buyers and sellers. Price discovery in the world's biggest tea market was competitive and transparent. Buyers bid weekly on teas from China, India, Sri Lanka, and East Africa, The auction and banking sector enabled brokers and foreign agents to secure a shipload or a single chest of exotic tea. The certified warehouses provided efficient storage, and logistics firms organized delivery to local retailers, blenders, and packers. It was a system that worked for 345 years, and at its peak, The world's tea auctions captured 80% of the international tea trade by volume. Joining us today is Sam Lambert, co-founder and chief operations officer of Zengate Global, a technology company whose Palmyra platform upgrades tea transactions with seamless blockchain traceability for all stakeholders, increasing trust, improving cross-border payment solutions, and conveniently providing access to financing. More in a minute, but first, this important message. What makes a perfect cup of Ceylon tea? The perfect cup is from the tea businesses that ensure the protection of all the children living within their tea estates. We salute Keilani Valley, Telawakili, Bogawanthalawa, Harana, and Eliftia Tea Estates. Support Save the Children, Sri Lanka. Tea planters intuitively sift the soil, sniff the wind, and scan the sky for clouds. Every day is Earth Day on the farm. The rest of us need a reminder of the complex tapestry of forest and farmscapes. This week, a sense of urgency and concern marked Earth Day 2024 celebrations as global temperatures surged to an unprecedented average of 1.58 degrees higher than the pre-industrial average. March temperatures averaged 14.1 degrees Celsius globally, and April's heat wave will likely extend a 10-month streak, with each month being the hottest of its kind. This alarming trend, with 19,000 weather stations already reporting record highs since January, underscores the pressing need for immediate action. Gavin Schmidt, director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, told the Washington Post that what happens in the next few months 
could indicate whether Earth's climate has undergone a fundamental shift, signaling a quantum leap in warming that is confounding climate models and stoking ever more dangerous weather extremes. June is the turning point as the El Nino climate pattern that emerged last year begins shifting to the cooler La Nina pattern, something that the National Weather Service predicts will happen by midsummer. Schmidt warns that, quote, even if the world returns to a more predictable warming trajectory, it will only be a temporary reprieve from the conditions that humanity must soon confront, end quote. In the meantime, the Amazon River has fallen to its lowest level since measurements began, and sea ice around Antarctica shrank to its lowest extent. Business Insight Amid the gloomy assessment of the changing climate, Sri Lanka's Boga Wantalawa Tea Estate stands apart as a champion of climate-positive tea. Last week, the estate was awarded the Green Apple, which signifies its climate-neutral certification from the Climate Neutral Group in the Netherlands. The estate has earned an impressive list of certifications, including Carbon Neutral, Rainforest, Fair Trade, 100% Renewable Energy, and Net Zero Energy Certification, a model of sustainable business Boga Wantalawa offers the tea industry a model to follow and a reason to celebrate progress on Earth Day next year. Investors ignored the bubble tea hyperbole and valued the Chao Panda chain's initial public offering well below the opening share price of $17.50 in Hong Kong currency. First day shares on Tuesday sold for as little as $10.80 Hong Kong, which is about $1.38 U.S., closing at Hong Kong $12.80 or $1.63, nearly 27% below the asking price. It was the worst first day performance of any initial public offering since 2022. Although the plunge was disappointing, the company raised more than $330 million, making it Hong Kong's largest market debut of 2024. Chichuan Baicha Baidao, which operates Cha Panda, is the third largest of China's bubble tea chains with 8,000 outlets. The company launched in 2008 when its founders opened a tiny store near a school in Chengdu. In 2018, growth accelerated to more than 8,000 franchise locations. In January, the company opened its first overseas store in Seoul, South Korea and is expanding into coffee shops. Sales grew by 56% to 5.7 billion renminbi during the past three years, equal to about 787 million U.S. dollars. Analysts noted several bubble tea makers are pursuing IPOs in the slumping Hong Kong stock market. In January, market-leading Misha Group, with 36,000 outlets, and Guming Holdings, with 9,000 outlets, applied for IPOs. Growing competition threatens the weaker players. Publicly traded shares of Nayuki, an 1,800-store competitor and the first chain to go public in 2021, has declined by 88%. Strategist Kenny Ning at Everbright Securities International told Bloomberg News, quote, The market is not giving this sector as lofty valuations as before, There has been an uneven revival of consumption in mainland China, so the profitability of consumer businesses remains uncertain. Business Insight IPO proceeds have slumped to the lowest levels in 20 years in Hong Kong, and the Hong Kong benchmark Hang Seng Index lost 14% of its value last year. China's fresh tea market is valued at 150 billion remembe. Transparency Market Research forecasts the 5.9% compound annual growth rate for tea and tea-based beverages globally through 2032, a projection that underscores this market segment's robust potential. 
TMR's T-Market Report valued the global industry at $20.2 billion in 2023, increasing to $33.9 billion by the end of 2032. TMR defines the category as any beverage prepared by infusing Camellia sinensis leaves. Key drivers are aroma, flavor, herbal ingredients, health benefits, and convenience. Green tea continues to be popular globally. In the U.S., imports of green tea increased from 3% in 1995 to 17% in 2010. Matcha is currently the fastest-growing green tea segment. Ready-to-drink tea is the most popular with 18- to 34-year-olds. Quote, iced tea is gaining traction in the industry, end quote, writes TMR. Loose tea powder accounts for approximately half the global market share. TMR writes that there is an endless supply of inventive tea-based beverage options. Six are trending. These include matcha latte, chai, boba bubble tea, Thai iced tea, black iced tea without artificial ingredients, colors, or preservatives. Tea is also popular as an ingredient in cocktails and mocktails. Researchers cite that a growing awareness of health benefits globally is driving sales. These four benefits include, first, antioxidant properties. Flavonoids and catechins, which are natural antioxidants, counteract free radical damage. This is particularly beneficial in preventing chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, all of which are caused by oxidative damage to cell Antioxidants in these beverages serve as a protective shield for our cells. Number two, heart health effects. Many studies have found that tea consumption may play an essential role in improving the heart health of individuals. In several studies, green tea consumption has been associated with lower LDL cholesterol levels and reduced vulnerability to cardiovascular disease and stroke. Three, weight loss benefits. Studies have been conducted on the potential benefits of tea for weight loss, specifically green tea. Combining green tea catechins with a healthy diet and exercise schedule can help increase fat oxidation and burn more calories. And four, mental health and cognitive benefits. Tea consumption may also benefit physical health, mental health, and cognitive function. The caffeine and L-theanine in tea enhances alertness, focus, and mood, and helps reduce stress, anxiety, and the symptoms linked to stress. According to a study published by the National Institutes of Health in September 2022, those who drank at least two cups of tea daily had a 9-13% to lower risk of death than non-tea drinkers. And now... A word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Nish. I grew up in an organic tea farm and I founded Nepal Tea Collective in 2016. Tea is not just a beverage for me, but a catalyst for social change, sustainably empowering hardworking artisans like my parents for the past 30 years. I'm on a mission to make the whole world aware of the goodness of Nepali teas and the good that comes from supporting growers in this remarkable land. If you haven't tasted Nepali teas yet, you're missing out. Our award-winning teas are making headlines. Find out why. Visit Nepal Tea Collective's website to get a free sample of this extraordinary taste of the Himalayas. That's nepalteacollective.com. Or just send me an email at nish, N-I-S-H, at nepalteacollective.com. Cheers. The London Tea Auction in 1679 was a version 1.0 marvel at connecting buyers and sellers. Price discovery in the world's biggest tea market was competitive and transparent. Buyers bid weekly on teas from China, India, Sri Lanka, and East Africa. The auction and banking sector enabled brokers and foreign agents to secure a shipload or a single chest of exotic tea. The certified warehouses provided efficient storage, and logistics firms organized delivery to local retailers, blenders, and packers. It was a system that worked for 345 years, and at its peak, 
the world's tea auctions captured 80% of the international tea trade by volume. Joining us today is Sam Lambert, co-founder and chief operations officer of Zengate Global, a technology company whose Palmyra platform upgrades tea transactions with seamless blockchain traceability for all stakeholders, increasing trust, improving cross-border payment solutions, and conveniently providing access to financing. Sam Lambert trained as an economist at the Australian National University and worked as an economist for the Australian government before joining global consulting company Oliver Wyman. He and Daniel Friedman started Zengate Global two years ago in Osaka, Japan. The firm employs 20 in multiple offices, including Sri Lanka, where it launched a pilot program with Sri Lanka tea producers. The Palmyra platform leverages decentralized ledger technologies from provenance and digital identities with verifiable credentials. Lambert explains that commodity markets, including coffee, rice, and grains, are rapidly digitizing and continue to evolve. He says the tea industry is experiencing a similar digital transformation, and the Palmyra platform provides an opportunity for, quote, underserved commodity producers to access new markets and leapfrog into the future. The Palmyra platform developed by Zengate Global enables one-stop online trades of tea and spices such as nutmeg and pepper and other commodities and enables producers to connect directly with buyers. Welcome to the program, Sam. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about how the Palmyra platform works. Sure. So the Palmyra platform, it's a commodity trading platform, and it's effectively a one-stop shop, which allows producers of different sizes to be able to onboard, list their products, and directly access global buyers. And the same was true as well on the, the buyer side as well. It provides one place where buyers from all around the world can directly source products and ensure that value flows directly to the producers themselves. And one of the things we noticed was a huge gap in trust um, across these global transactions. And we found ourselves in the business of trying to find ways to build and bridge the trust gaps that, that were there. And one of the things that we worked on was around making things such as payments, cross-border payments, super easy, making escrow payments available so that you can reduce counterparty risk and making sure that the logistics and the customs and the certification processes of that deal was also very transparent as well. We're working quite closely with the tea producers um, out of several markets, as well as other commodities as well, such as spices and honey. Will you describe for listeners the platform's relevance to the tea community globally, both in terms of smallholders and larger multinational companies? I think the biggest impact is actually for specialty um, and artisanal producers and premium grade producers who don't have a formal way to, to sell their products. And one of the things that really fascinated me when I came and started learning about the tea sector is was my understanding and my research around the way tea is sold. And you have things such as the Sri Lankan, um, you know, the Colombo tea auction, several other auctions and markets where tea gets sold in bulk. And it's a great system that's been around for a while. But what became clear to me is that for certain types of products that sat potentially on the edge or the periphery of, of what was able to be conducted through the auction were left behind. So a key focus of ours was not so much how do we completely disrupt and change the way the, the tea auctions worked. It was, no, go ahead. Um, you know, that system has been around for a while. There's a lot of process and people that are dedicated and investment that goes into maintaining and improving that process. There's actually quite a big gap of unaddressed producers who are creating really high quality teas that needed a way that was just as good or if not better than the way that a tea auction worked. So our focus became focusing on those types of customers and creating the financial infrastructure and the logistical infrastructure and building the bridge between um, them and buyers from around the world. 
it, it, it really depends on the size of the business. The technology is scalable. You could be a small holder producing, you know, a hundred kilos a, of tea a month to someone that's producing, you know, 20,000 kilos of, uh, of tea a day. Um, so it's, it, it is able to accommodate a wide range of producers and, and different classes of buyers, depending on how much they want to order. Um, but really the, the core of it was where were the unaddressed markets and what, what solutions did they need to be able to get access to, to be able to compete at that level. Classic outcry auctions are limiting, elitist, and outdated. High-volume tea auction centers are now digitized. The smaller producers are drawn to web auctions that attract bidders near and far. Most specialized platforms are generally low-volume, however. Palmera offers high-volume commodity tea, cinnamon, pepper, nutmeg, along with specialty products like polyfloral $5 a kilo dark amber Zambian forest honey, and $9 per kilo Sri Lanka cinnamon powder. It offers an amber uva oolong that sells for $150 per kilo, or pitu bamboo green tea for $145 per kilo. It, it's really helpful sometimes to actually take a step back, not just looking at tea itself. And that may seem counterintuitive if you've been working in the tea or even coffee space, um, which I, I imagine some of your audience work in uh, for decades. But really what needs to be done, which is the approach we took, is what, what actually happens in other commodity markets? And you have to ask yourself the question, what, what's the benchmark in terms of where things could be? And when you look at precious metals, different types of metal markets or wheats, grains, coffee is also actually a great example to actually do research in. You find that most of these markets don't have an auction system. There's no outcry system. And, and you actually realize very quickly that in terms of the scale of how good a market could look like, the auction outcry system is on the bottom end of where it starts. And when you look at the more mature markets, you find that there's a, there's a risk market involved where people can speculate and trade. They can manage risks around prices going up and down through the use of financial instruments like futures and forwards. We see that with corn, oil, gold, silver, wheat. The big commodities that you can sort of think of, there's a financing element that's available to them, not, not in a closed system, but access into a global capital market where you have, mm -hmm. you have billions and trillions of dollars of trade financing flowing into these commodities, making it easier so that producers can grow quicker, traders can speculate, buyers can grow quicker. So when you look at these systems, you know, when we touch on certifications, for example, they have a full system around that. They have a full system around warehouse receipts and the ability to, to use that as collateral. So there's actually a huge opportunity in terms of some markets that we've looked into that may seem like they run really well, but when you actually look at it with a different lens from the lens of what, what are the biggest and most mature markets doing, they actually do things very differently. And in some cases, you'll never get to that end of what, what is possible just because the way some of these markets work. And one of our advisors actually was the former uh, chief of commodities of the United Nations. He's set up commodity exchanges from scratch in countries such as, in, as India, Indonesia. The Indian multi-commodities exchange, when he was there, was the second biggest commodities exchange in the world. And he was able to see um, some of the, the impacts that, that he was able to have uh, through, through, the, through the exchange. So our, our goal was never to out-compete an existing system. Our goal was always to expand the bandwidth of what people were already doing today and fill the gaps as well. And we have a we're, we're, we have a very different mentality, which I think comes from the fact that um, you know, many of the, the team members come from a blockchain background. And the blockchain background isn't so much how do I serve myself in, in, in the best way, but how do I serve the ecosystem in the best way? So mm -hmm. we have a system that we follow called a minimum viable ecosystem when we enter new markets when we enter new commodities, where we, we, we have a blueprint which says, 
who are the key people within the ecosystem that we need to collaborate with, not compete against, but collaborate with. And the thing about tea that I love so much is that not only is it a welcoming industry, but there's a lot of really good systems that already exist. You have the exporters, for example, in countries such as Sri Lanka that have a great network into freight forwarding partners. They have a great understanding of how logistics works. They have a great understanding of how warehousing works. And you can say the same with brokers, for example, who have an intimate understanding of how you do financing, how you have uh, grading and certifications, how you build that trust with producers and with buyers. And, and the regulators as well, who've been doing this from the beginning, trying to create a, a regulatory framework which enables people to, to perform and enables people to grow. So for us, it was never, it was never a, we want to build something that replaces the, the auction. It was so much, um, we want to build something that empowers those on the edges firstly, but ultimately can collaborate with all of the skills and all of the processes that these people have. And I'm not an expert when it comes to grading. I'm not an expert when it comes to logistics, but we have a collaborative approach. And if we're able to pull the right people together, which we have to date, we can empower all of these producers and we can change the way commodities such as tea are bought. And we can change the narrative around the lack of trust that exists in these cross-border transactions. Selling tea to neighbors at local markets worked great in China, where the average domestic price in 2022 for a kilo of green tea was $22, about 161 renminbi. Export prices, however, averaged only $1.59 per kilo for Chinese green tea. The situation is reversed in India, East Africa, Nepal, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka, where the export prices far exceed domestic retail Direct sales are common worldwide. The difference today is that distant markets seeking premium tastes are willing to pay higher prices for quality tea. Just to touch on the bit around um, pricing and price discovery, I think you, you nailed that on the head. And it's not so much that there isn't enough people doing these direct sales, because there's a lot of people doing direct sales. And there's a lot of people doing direct sales either by word of mouth or email in a somewhat archaic system, which doesn't happen anywhere in other commodities. That can definitely be approved upon. But when you have a platform such as Palmyra, you, you get access to really important data. And you have a better visibility around teas being sold in all sorts of different types of markets. And you can start to build a map of understanding like which teas get sold into which regions, how are they priced? And instead of just being a, you know, a standalone producer making high quality teas, you empower them with price information. You give them information around these are the types of teas that sell you know, into these markets at these prices, and they get a much better feedback system in terms of how should they price their teas, what are other companies doing around marketing, storytelling, and and which is a bit that you just mentioned, Dan. And the thing that that shocked me, which I was saying to you earlier, was that all of these producers have such depth in terms of their story, the purpose of what they're doing, and how they're doing it as well. And often a lot of this doesn't actually come through. It's not so much that consumers are trying to source tea directly from a producer. A lot of these producers are doing B2B. They're selling to other businesses such as you know, leading online stores. So it might be a brick and mortar store who then have their own customer base. And if you're unable to actually translate the story, if you're unable to be able to share that story so that after that B2B to C, the customer understands what the story is, then we're doing a disservice. And the producer gets a disservice done to them as well because the tea at the end of the day doesn't get sold at the price it probably should be. So being able to succinctly tell a story around the producer, uh, for example, it could be um, uh, Holiska who runs uh, uh, Siddha Devi Tea in Nepal. Like uh, I'm sure you've heard of her story before and, and her story around... Um, empowering women and and training uh, these world class female tea makers who used to be victims of domestic violence or different sort of social outcomes they had had previously in, in the past, 
And, and to be able to share a story like that is incredible because the end consumer cares about it so much. So for yeah. us, that was one thing, but being able to do it through data was another bit as well. And we had spent a lot of time building out our traceability protocol, which not only tracks information around provenance, but allows you to embed certification and credentials and, and, and different data points that ultimately can be shared. And because this stuff sits on, on the blockchain, it's not so much we have to do a download on our private database and send you the information. It's already there. The, the end buyer who then sells to the end consumer takes that data and says, cool, thank you. I'm going to append, add my bits to it. And then the consumer gets access to that complete chain of uh, data throughout the supply chain itself. And that's the thing that I think is, is a bit of a game changer that we don't talk too much about um, just yet, but uh, it, it empowers the end buyers and the end consumers to have the full understanding of where this tees from, what the story is, and why they should ultimately buy it. Sam, will you explain how Famira facilitates financing? Take a lesson from what the brokers have been doing. It's collateralized lending, which they're actually providing. They take stock of the the tea itself in a warehouse that is is you know in essence licensed because they're one of in Sri Lanka, for example, there's the eight brokers who are licensed by the the tea board. Like there's so many opportunities that could be done there, and making sure capital flows into the right places and and micro loans exactly like you said, can have an enormous impact if done right. And if done across a big base, there's a lot of capital that can flow into this space. So that was something that's important to us long-term and, and in the medium term that we collect the right data so that we can prove this stuff to, to those that are willing to lend. And the last bit on the data piece is around traceability and compliance requirements. So what you've seen, assuming um, you, you're so up to date on this, is the European Union's deforestation regulation is one example of many to come where governments and some of the largest import markets are now beginning to regulate what is allowed to come into the countries and come into the trading blocks. And they will require data and in this case, traceability types of data, traceability requirements and compliance requirements in order to let the products in. So the EUDR doesn't impact tea yet, but impacts coffee. It impacts palm oil, impacts a number of different commodities. And it's a matter of time until tea goes on that list. And when tea goes on that list, my question is, who is helping tea producers who is helping, who is providing the technology to tea producers at the grassroot level all the way up to larger businesses to be able to actually collect that data and comply with the regulations? Because yeah. if, if people don't do that, then the reality is that many people lose access to these big markets. It's not just European Union. The US is starting to put some stuff into place through the FDA traceability program, which starts in 2026. And is this stuff has to start today. And we've been investing in traceability technology for the last two years. It's only now that it's done to make sense and that we've got some real applications that can be used. But, yeah. you know, it takes a while to build these solutions and to, to actually spend the time thinking about what is required and what works on the ground properly all the way up to what works at the regulatory level. And my concern is that not enough people are actually worried about this stuff and that, you know, if left behind, the producers get left behind. And I think the complacency around not tackling some of these problems in some markets, not all, but in some markets, is, is going to place a huge risk on the, the producers in the region who, whose main focus right now is to produce tea. It's not to collect data. But if we don't shift that focus, then market access becomes a huge issue all of a sudden. So that is what defines our sort of data strategy and what we believe is um, what's the most crucial in terms of what we capture in the system and how we can translate that back to the people using it. Intrigued by what you heard in today's podcast? Would you like to learn more from our global network of T-Biz journalists and T-experts? 
Remember to visit the T-Biz website for more comprehensive coverage. That's www.t-bizbiz.com. Thanks for listening. Farewell till next week. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.